So, panel. Panelists. So, really today's panel for the next 15, 20 minutes is we've heard different viewpoints. We've had various questions about you know, private, who's responsible for these problems? Is it us as individuals? Is it the private sector? Is it the public sector? And you could look, looking from the outside, looking in to the private and to the public sector, everyone has different agendas. And really, as two different sectors, is it one combined problem or is it individual's problems? So think of some questions that you would like to ask the panelists. I'll display the questions up. You can either put your hand up or just type them in and we'll display them up like we did earlier this morning. So we've, we won't ask Richard to introduce himself. I think we've already heard enough from Richard this morning. Or, um, so then if you can introduce yourself, oh, sure. please, that would be great. Yeah. My name is Madeline Carr. I'm a lecturer at Aberystwyth University in the Department of International Politics there, where we're building a research and teaching focus on uh, uh, these issues, cybersecurity and internet governance, but from a, a global political perspective rather than strictly a technical perspective. Yeah, and Tim Wade from Logicalis. Uh, I've been with Logicalis for 15 years working in the, the, the general IT space, and before that, 20 years in the military. Um, in IT where I came up against these issues every day. Thank you. And Tim, maybe if I can start off with yourself. Logic, uh, Logicalis are obviously heavily involved both on the private sector and the public sector. Who's, who, who's responsible for this problem? Should there be collaboration? Should there be a divide between the two? What's your view? So, so I think you have to stand back and look at uh, the problem. And, and the problem is always when someone's got something that someone else wants. Yep. Yep. So when you start to look at uh, what goes into a finance institution in terms of you know, multiple layers of wrap, uh, two different manufacturers, firewalls back to back, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they're looking after your or my finance data very carefully in the same way that some government organizations look after our nation's data. So it's the same problem, but it's looking at the angle about what's important to protect. Okay. If, you know, this morning and even now, a minute ago, you know, I showed some very simple techniques on extracting very sensitive information or, you know, where people are using cloud services, but maybe some of the minimal, most basic fundamental components of information security are not present. Should someone be accountable for that? Should someone from a, the public sector or government be saying, look, if you're going to do this in the cloud, this is the minimi, minimal baseline function or feature that should be available for private sectors to use that cloud service? So, so I've just got a quick insight before I pass it on. There's a bad bit inside of me from my, my previous life. That's what I'm trying to find, and, and And I sat listening to the Internet of Things security debate this morning thinking, I really want to know about that person's fridge and kettle. Because I want to know when it's not been switched on or the door hasn't been opened for 24 hours, because I'm then going to go and break into their house. Yep. You know, we used to do it in, in different ways, repeated phone calls, if you got answered, that sort of thing. But there are now more sophisticated ways of, of doing that. I was flummoxed, you know, I was totally floored when they were a whole step ahead in that they're taking over the cameras and using it to do a recce before they go in. So who's responsible for that data? You and I are as individuals to protect ourselves. So in any organisation, someone in management needs to be responsible, informed and responsible for that, is my view. It's not something government can mandate for. It's, it's people that understand the business they're protecting. I don't does anyone else? Anyone else want to elaborate on that? Or? Well, I, I can say from a, um, from a sort of whole of government approach that in the West, in countries like the UK and the US and Canada and Australia, there's very much uh, from a policy perspective this emphasis on what we call the public-private partnership. And, uh, and governments have been 
they, they, they refer to this as, as the cornerstone or the hub of our national cybersecurity strategies. So very, very important. But when you actually get down and, and sort of unpack what it is, there isn't really any partnership there. Um, there's a financial arrangement between a certain sector of the private sector, the, the um, security pr um, provision, security service provision sector, um, and that's just a financial relationship where uh, cybersecurity can be outsourced. But when you get into things like um, like Chris mentioned earlier in, in, in uh, I think during your presentation, Richard, about uh, critical infrastructure, owners and operators of critical infrastructure, of which some 87% uh, is in the private hands in the UK and the US, those organizations do not see themselves as responsible for national security. They see themselves as private sector, uh, you know, they're, they're there to make a profit by, by selling energy and not to provide national security. So they don't see themselves as part of this partnership. They don't want to fund national security and they don't want to be liable for national security. So very much like that Sony hack where the, the boss says, oh, this was unprecedented, we had no playbook. Of course he wants to promote that view that this was North Korea, it was way beyond what a private sector organization could be liable for, because otherwise he has to take responsibility for it. So that, there's a big contention there about who is responsible for this. Okay, you sure you want to hand me this? <laughs> this is on. I'm the cynical American who sat up here and said it's about money, and unfortunately the public sector has none. Um, and the private sector only put it uh, against the security infrastructure when it's in, in their best interest to do so, or they, f they, they line it up and they can make a business case for it. Um, so I, but it's odd, isn't it, that um, for, for me it's, a, it's, it's an attitude. I don't know if you know, but you know, the, the Sony hack, the large portion of it took place in the Docklands. So it was on the UK soil, and, uh, and I didn't see, unless you did, uh, the information commissioner officer didn't even issue a warning to Sony. I look across and you look at the Irish Information Commissioner office and watch every day how he's poking, Amazon poking, Google poking, Microsoft. I mean, he'll, he'll take on the private sector and say, you need to protect our data. Uh, so for, for me, I see the opposite. You know, the only people I see fined uh, by the ICO here in, the, uh, uh, in England and Wales and Scotland are NHSs, you know, who lose a laptop of 500, you know. So, geez, I, I, and I feel terrible for them. I feel terrible because, you know, the real, the real Real data breaches are happening in the private sector. Certainly, the important ones happen in NHS. I, you know, you lose a medical record; it's 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 uh, it's going to hurt. Um, but you know, I see no difference. The, the line that I draw in between public and private is money, and uh, public sector is is only going to get the money when we complain to our elected representatives to give the NHSs the money to protect our medical data. Great. Panelists, do you see, so you've got new EU regulation coming in in 2017 about breach of data and then reporting it within 24 hours. Do you think this is going to put a slightly different twist on it where maybe some of the public uh, breaches that may occur, do occur, will become public, will put a slightly different twist on this? Tim? That's, that's an interesting one because, you know, it will uh, force a whole level of um, administration around this that's just another cost. And if you start to look at the administrative costs in things like our NHS, in our education sectors, and the amount of data they're holding um, that has some level of sensitivity, that there's going to be a whole you know, new class of people that are involved in, in policing this and, and, and flushing it out. Uh, I still think that a whole load will go on below the radar outside of the public sector because um, the government has this issue that it can't break its own laws, but public sector can, the private sector can c turn a blind eye occasionally. Yeah. And it certainly won't flush out the, the attacks against the household yeah. um, where, where people have the irritation of ransomware or whatever. Okay, great. Well, I think there's all kinds of good reasons why companies don't want to report breaches, obviously. Reputational damage is one of them, and, and competitor advantage is another one. You know, if they, if they know something that could impact on, on others in their industry, it's in their advantage to hold on to that. Um, I think that law will change the landscape uh, to an extent. I, I definitely do. But I've also spoken to some um, cybersecurity practitioners, and, and you guys would be better placed to, to um, judge this or not, but 
who have said that it's not always um, black and white when they're experiencing some kind of intrusion, that it may be minor, it may build up into something more, more substantial, it may, they, they're not always immediately clear on what's happening anyway, and that's also one of the reasons why they don't report straight away. Uh, mandatory disclosure is everything, everything, everything. It all starts with mandatory disclosure. You know, God love the Californians over there who actually started the whole thing in the states. Uh, there's still only 47 of the 50 states that have the mandatory disclosure, and it all started in California uh, by a consumer revolt who said, we just suspect there's major breaches. It's, a, it's that tree that falls in the woods. It doesn't make a sound unless it's reported. And this reporting that's going on across Europe on do it on the honor system that's it's so like my mother used to say, go get me something to beat you with. I said, yeah, all right, I'll be right back, Mom. Here, here's a feather, knock yourself out. It, 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 there is no honor among, there, why, why would there be? Until there's mandatory disclosure, disclosure and people have to, by law, raise up their hands and say, I've lost your data and tell me how I've affected you and I will make amends and make a public uh, disclosure. We don't have anything. Every single uh, stat that we've seen here today why, why it comes from the states is because that's where the mandatory disclosure is, and that's where we get the, 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 the stats. And so we're just now quantifying the problem because of mandatory disclosure that kicked off three, four years ago in the states. Yeah, great point, Richard. So if you look at the private sector at the moment, and it, you know, if you look at a large number of the tech companies now and cloud companies, they actually have a, like a bug bounty. So if you find a security vulnerability, we'll pay you. Maybe. You know, would you, do you think that's something the public sector should consider? I find that deeply problematic. And that, is it um, uh, Kevin Mitnick now that has that online, uh, he's buying and selling zero day exploits. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that that needs to be really regulated. And, and if the public sector has to uh, foot the bill for it, uh, that, that, that's one alternative. But I don't think that a private market in those things is, is a good idea. I'm amazed that he's allowed to do that, actually. Yeah, so you know, the, the examples I was thinking of, Microsoft, Google, whoever, you report directly to them, and depending on the level of the vulnerability, um, depends on the amount of bounty that they pay. Uh, I've got other views on Kevin Mitnick. You know, mm. Maybe he's that bridge crossing the chasm between the dark side and the mm. private side. Yeah, you know, He's mm. been there, he's seen it on both sides. Uh, no, just interesting in your views. Mm. Tim? I think that's one that we share in both the public and yep. the, the private sector, and, and uh, you know the morality of it is is the bit that strikes me as as being the issue that we need to get our heads around, okay. not the fact that it's a, a a thing for one side or the other to address. Do we see any real collaboration between private and public at the moment? Do you do you see it? Uh, they pay the bills. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's 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 you know. In business, we talk about a partnership, which is a business relationship, yeah. and we treat our public partnerships the same. Okay. You know, but they're business relationships. Yeah. You, you still have to have a, a thriving business at the end of it that, that can continue to provide service into the future. Are there any questions? We've got one question up. Do anyone else? Yes, please, at the back. So while the microphone is just going to the back, we've had a question from the audience. Should we have a global internet law? I'd like to see how we enforce it, manage it, police it. But views on that? Maybe Richard? <laughs> uh, yeah. one, one minute. Okay. You know? That's all you have. <laughs> um, first of all, that's a brilliant question. I, can't, I don't think we spend enough time just walking around saying that. I don't hear that question enough no? at conferences. First time I've ever Whoever said that, good for you. Who said they, it? Oh, there you Good go. <laughs> for you. There is no law on the internet. That's our problem. We don't get it. There's no right. There's no wrong. You cannot break a law. You can buy people. You can buy narcotics. You can buy bad things. There's no right, no wrong, no police force on the internet. It's, an, it's a town that is lawless. And, 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 and we don't understand that when we connect. And you know, so it makes natural sense to put a law on the internet. It just, how can we complain? But yeah, as, as you brought up, where do you start? Because we've unleashed the dragon, it's, it's already, you know, to put that genie back in a box and, and put a frame around it and say, yeah, I can't do that, but you can do that. You can't do that, and it's, it's gotta be led by the private sector. They brought us to the web, they showed us how to make money, and if we conflict in that any way, shape or form, we won't be able to control it. So it needs to be a private sector initiative. It's not gonna, I've worked with academia many, many years, a lot of great ideas, 
ideas, but forget it. Until Microsoft or, or Amazon or Google gets behind it, then you don't want Google to get behind a secure internet idea, <laughs> trust me. Um, but, but, but Richard, the, the private sector to solve it, but isn't it owned by the public sector? <laughs> is it? I don't think it I is. Don't know. Yeah, I, no, exactly. I, you know, what yeah, is the internet? The <laughs> Isn't is the internet a public highway yeah. uh, that should be you know with public funds? I, I, I don't, what's your natural, what's your instinct tell you? My instinct tells me I go on the web to do business or I look for information. I find it as a, it's like a library to me or a store to me. Uh, and it, it, it very, uh, you know, and, and because of that, either the stores or the libraries have to start, you know, putting their books in an order or the stores need to say, this is how we'll interact and take your payments. Uh, but it's, it's only a, a means to an end. The way I get to that store, the way I get to that reference, that, that piece of data, it, 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 the, the servers that take me there, uh, the ISPs that, that give me access to this information, they're just a per, you know, a pay for fee. I don't, I can't get my head around it. I really can't. Who's the, who's the traffic cop at the intersection? I used to say it's ISPs. I, I, and, but I don't, you know, I, I, I don't see it now. We've gotten too complex and. Good. Question at the back, because. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, I'm a colleague of Madeline's at uh, the Department of International Politics. Um, one of my partner colleagues on my project, Andy Blythe, was saying earlier that what we have is an ecosystem. I looked at the public-private partnership issue, and what I believe we're actually in a multi-stakeholder system. I think that's a much better way of describing the environment we're in. And I look, I mean, that question on the board is a pretty good one. Um, if we look at the debates that have been taking place in the Internet Governance Forum, I think that can offer an insight or some better model to look at not public private partnerships but at multi stakeholderism and that we're all swimming in the same ecosystem together. Now, I wonder how you feel about that. So, I was trying to, to think of an analogous situations. And, and I started with the Geneva Convention, which is a bit of an odd one. I think it's probably closer to the, um, the International Laws of the Sea, and, and I can't get my head around the name of them exactly, where you know, a, a group of users have come together to, to ensure that they've got effectively safe use of, of what is a, a shared asset, an internationally shared asset. Um, and I, I suspect my biggest difficulty is that all of these emanated out of Europe initially. And I suspect the drive to get something to, to, to control the internet is going to have to come out of the Pacific Rim, um, with both China and, and California as being the sort of key, key energies in that. And it's, it's, it's how we get that together to, to get that sort of leadership to then get people to step in behind that will be the biggest problem. Can I just come back on a couple of those things? I have a little bit of a different view from, from Richard about the issue of law. Um, and I, I just would, would also point out this, this uh, <laughs> we're still friends though, this uh, view that the private sector, uh, you know, um, brought us the internet and in a way they, of course they did, but remember that actually that was a government funded project and it took years of refusing to allow commercial data um, across that network to entice the private sector into building out the infrastructure. So that was a very carefully managed transition by the Gore-Clinton administration that more or less forced the private sector into investing in that technology. They didn't actually lead in the beginning there. I don't think that law is a market, um, can be market-led myself, because law is about protecting uh, the vulnerable and protecting uh, civil rights and human rights. And I don't, I'm not sure that uh, Amazon or Google or Microsoft uh, really would be able to do that because their job is to make money. That's not unethical. That's just that, that that's what they're meant to be doing. And I'm not really uh, convinced that that they could um, be relied upon to create any kind of legal order. Uh, that would be equitable. And the law of the sea is a really interesting analogy, and that's one that's often used. That, that is in this sense of what we call um, a, uh, a commons or a global good. And, but a commons, actually, the, the concept of that is that there's something that we all need, we all want access to, like the fish in the sea, and if someone takes too much, they'll deplete it. 
So you have to have some agreements about how you can use it. Um, but the internet isn't quite like that because it doesn't suffer from overuse. Well, may maybe in some ways it does, but th there, people do use that analogy and it's, it's quite interesting to think that way. But there's also a sort of limit to how far we can go with that. Okay, so <clears throat> I think the conclusion is security is a public and private sector issue. Um, we've got a long way to go for collaboration, joint partnership, joint working. I think it's a debate that's going to be going on for some time. Um, but I'm going to keep coming back to, I think, before we start pointing the finger at private sector, public sector, we've got to think, are we doing the basics ourselves properly? You know, and you know, looking at some of the things we've seen today, some of the live examples, um, even some of the results of the questions, we need to really focus what we're doing at home individually first of all. Once we've got that place in order, then we can really start considering what we need to do next. So <clears throat> before we um, break for coffee, um, three more questions. So if you can pull out your app. Again, um, the questions will be under the security is a public and or private sector issue on the agenda. Scroll down to the very bottom and you'll see three questions relative to your um, domain, be it managerial, business development, sorry, I'm getting tired, managerial, software development or technical. So before you break for a coffee, please uh, answer those questions. We're running uh, about five minutes behind, so if you want to come back into the room at five past, that would be fine by me if that's okay with yourselves. Okay. Thank you, panel. Thank you very much.